before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds nerds. of sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Thank you for joining us today for our conversation with acclaimed chef Dominique Crenn and Mother Jones's Maddie Oatman. We're here in honor of Chef Crenn's new book, Rebel Chef, In Search of What Matters. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can ask it in either the comment or chat section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to keep the public informed during this outbreak, we're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. These programs are currently free to the public, so we ask that you please consider making a donation to help us continue our work during these times. You can visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more. And you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Dominique Crenn and Maddie Oatman to Inforum. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Maddie Oatman, senior editor at Mother Jones Magazine and host of the Mother Jones Food Politics podcast, Bite. And I'm so pleased to be in conversation today with Chef Dominique Crenn. Bonjour. Uh, <laughs> bonjour. Dominique is an acclaimed restaurateur, a vocal activist, and the first female chef in the United States to receive three Michelin stars. And today we are going to touch on a lot of timely topics, I hope. Um, and to start, she'll be discussing her new book, Rebel Chef, In Search of What Matters. It's a memoir that chronicles her journey challenging the status quo and becoming one of the most successful chefs of a generation. If you'd like to ask a question, please ask it in the chat if you are watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. So... Let's get started. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dominique. 
Oh, um, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is this is a really strange time to be talking to you and also a great time to be talking to you. And so I think to start, I just wondered how you've been doing during the lockdown and kind of what it's been like for you. Um, well, it's, it's, it's been um, a quite a, an, an interesting time for me. Um, I don't know if you know, but last year I was also on the lockdown. I was going through um, about eight to nine months of cancer treatment. So I was literally at home, you know, during that time. And I was looking forward for 2020 to be the day and the time and the year where I can go out and just travel the world. <laughs> Um, so the, pandem the pandemic happened and, and then, you know, Black Lives Matter happened. But, you know, it's um, um, I looked at it as uh, a time to reflect, but uh, to reflect on who we are and what really matters with the pandemic. But I mean, I'm, I'm in the food industry, so um, we were at the front line of like, you know, serving people and making sure the community had food on the table, you know, from the me medical workers and children and elderly people and obviously the community. And so it was, you know, um, we were doing what we needed to do. But yes, it's, um, it's a very interesting time. But I think we have an, um, an incredible opportunity with what's going on in the United States right now and what's going on in the world. So... Uh, I'm excited about the future. I want to ask you a little more about that. Um, I I did really enjoy reading your book, Rebel Chef. It is quite an entertaining read. I think I read it all in one sitting. Wow. Um, but I wondered why now, or I guess it was probably a few years ago, why it felt like a good time to write a memoir. Well, I mean, um, so about two years ago, Penguin uh, uh, came to my um, agent and and they asked him if I was interested in of talking about my life. And, and then he was like, well, what, this is Penguin. You guys don't do cookbook. It's like, oh, we're not interested in cooking book. We want to hear a voice. And I think she has a voice and, and she has something to say. And I always wanted to, you know, Maybe the fact that I didn't go to cooking school, it was not, I, I felt that I had other things to say and, and um, it was the right timing. So 2018, then through 2019, we finished the book at the end of 2019. It went uh, to the publisher in, in the, I think, January 2020. And then... Um, and then, you know, everything happened. But I think it's, uh, you know, I'm someone that is very curious and um, I always like to reflect and to share my story, but also to be able to inspire, but inspire others. And um, I think I use food as, as, as a language and now I, I use a pen as a language. So it was it was pretty natural for me to do that. And obviously, you know, I was very lucky to have an incredible a person like Emma Brooks that helped me to write the book. So English is not my first language. <laughs> um, so I, I think maybe a lot of people who had seen the chef's table, for instance, or, you know, heard from you over the years knew that you were adopted. Um, right. But the story, the actual story of why your family chose you is kind of remarkable. Um, and I wondered if you could retell that, um, you know, the part about your brother. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful story. Um, so to give a little bit of context, you know, in the 1960, uh, 50, 60, 70, um, adoption were um, a very interesting process. And especially uh, for a, a French couple to wanted to adopt um, um, kids that had no idea where they were coming from was uh, remarkable at the time and were quite courageous. Um, I was abandoned when I was six months and I was hanging out in an orphanage and uh, they, call it, they called me very young, uh, the, the, the smiley 
the smiley face girl, you know, I was like always like bubbly and shady and wanted to do, you know, uh, to be out there and just have fun with people. And then literally my brother, I think, shows me. He was, he, he's uh, 15 years, I'm sorry, 15 months older than me. And and he was walking, I guess, with my mom and my dad through the orphanage. And somehow they just turned around and suddenly he was like holding me, you know, and kissing me. And my mom was like, okay, that's the one that we want. <laughs> that little one, who is that? Um, you know, this is... The, Two beautiful people that couldn't have kids and they wanted to you know share their love to you know kids that didn't have a chance to have you know a, a home so um I don't know it's just it's it's a beautiful story you know I think I always say it's easy to have kids like you can you know you sleep with someone you can have kids but it's not easy to be a parent and they were really apparent to me so to 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 my brother and I so um uh, we were very lucky so and you know it, it seems like you you felt that um you didn't always fit in with kids your age but it wasn't because you were adopted it was it was because of some other things yeah I um you know I've been very curious all my life and I never felt that I fit it in, 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 in one category, you know, um, if you look at my upbringing, um, I was surrounded. I literally hang out with everyone from, from everywhere. You know, it was really diverse. My group was very diverse. I didn't want to be like, you know, the girl with the long hair and hanging out just with the girl. You know? No, I just, it was not me. I wanted to, I was a tomboy, first of all. I wanted to be a soccer player. I wanted to just tell people that, hey, I'm here to see me, you know? And I wanted to be curious about others and I wanted to learn more about what was the others. But I was also very young age. I was, um, they called me the Zorro, which, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I um, I literally was all about justice. If you, mm. if, if anyone is bullying in my school or anyone is, you know, bothering my brother, my friend, I was there and I was there to kick some ass. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also not sure I, <laughs> I don't believe it. I really do. <laughs> I'm not sure I've heard of that many um, 11 year olds who are that entranced with politics um, yeah. to the point that you begged your parents to take a trip to communist Poland. Yes. What do you remember about that trip? Well, I, I remember that I, I was watching, you know, the TV and it was during the cold War, And then I was, then I talked to my dad and I was just like, dad is just, tell me about this. I don't understand why, you know, what's going on. And he started to talk to me and I'm like, you know what? You have friends in Poland. Let's go to Poland. And, I'm, and he's like, you're 11 years old. What are you, how are you going to get to Poland? It's like, well, you have friends in Poland. My brother and I can go to Poland. I know there is a train that go from France to the East. Remember the East Germany, Germany and the West Germany was still happening. So it was about, 34 hours of train and he said well you can put us on the train and then we will then tell your friend and they come and pick us up at the train station and he's like dumb it's not that easy and I'm like this is very easy because I said to my dad I don't want to learn through the media I want to see for myself and my dad was like and my mom was like okay so it was my brother and I on the train and it was a, it was a, it was quite a very it was very um, uh, one of the most incredible experience I ever had because remember it was a, it was probably two three o'clock in the morning we were in a train and then suddenly we heard a lot of of, of voices it was German voices and then then my brother and I, and I looked outside of the window and and it was like those German soldier line up with their rifle and their dog. And they got into the train and they were like, passport, passport. That's what I heard, you know. And we were in uh, East Germany. 
and East Germany was not free at the time. And then, uh, so that was, a, you know, for 11 years old, that was a little bit scary. And um, then when we arrived in Poland and I fell in love with the people of Poland and their story and their struggle. And I just, I was just, I was taken and I understood that politics didn't have anything to do with the people that were living in the country. It had to do with people in power that often were not the voice of the people that were living in the country. So, and so I, I kind of knew that very young. And yeah, that that concept has kind of um, something I hold on to the last couple of years <laughs> traveling outside of the U.S. I right. think people around the world, many people have a sense of that. That <laughs> right. So, um, uh, and it's also to say to people, you know, do not judge people because they li- they're from a certain country. Get to know them. Get to know them and, and really op- open your heart and, and your mind to others that uh, might not be the voice of whatever president is at the helm, you know. So it's just, you know, it gives you... Um, um, a different way and sense to look at humanity differently, you know. And um, I think it was really impregnated inside of me for at a very young age. And also not understanding where my uh, DNA was from also. I, I knew that I could um, uh, present myself to a certain, you know, privilege or certain elite because I didn't, you know, I'm just a human, you know, and I don't really know anything about myself. So, so it's been, yeah, very young. It kind of opened up, you know, I don't know why I'm not a politician today, to be honest with you. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe because you know all of that. Yeah, perhaps. (laughs) Um, And so you famously did not go to cooking school or even work in a restaurant before getting your first job. Um, yeah. But you did make sandwiches at a summer camp, and you at a country club, a, a country ten, club, a tennis club in France. Yes, and you were fin- and they were phenomenally good. Yes, you say so. Yeah. I, I wonder, like, what made your sandwiches stand stand out? Um, because I was, um, I wanted to use the best ingredient, like my mom and my and my grandmother taught me, and I knew it was all about the bread. And it was about layering flavors with the best ingredient you could find uh, in front of you at the supermarket. So, and I, I was very, you know, taking this very seriously, you know, I had my baguette and it needed to be fresh and from the best baker. And then I had to layer flavors, you know, it could be, you know, it could be saucisson, it could be ham, it could be tomato, but everything needs to be layered inside making sure a little bit of salt and pepper, a little cornichon, a touch of butter. That was it. Less it was more, but it was all about the bread and the ingredient inside was elevating the taste of the, the beautiful baguette that people were biting into it. So, and, and I think that's what a sandwich should be. It should be less and more. It's more. It should be all about beautiful ingredient, but it, you don't have to, it, it doesn't have to be abundance like, 10,000 thing. It's just, you want to test, you know, it's, it's testing. It's very important, you know, <laughs> um, I, let's, we, not, let's not talk about American sandwiches, but <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think you might be proud. My household has, my husband made his own mayonnaise, which is probably yes. more common for, <laughs> yes, for you, but um, it has really elevated our sandwich game recently. Right. <laughs> I think it, it teaches you when you take care of what you have in front of you. It could be a sandwich. It could be a, you can write, you can, you can take a picture. You, you can, you know, take, you know, do painting or singing. If you take care of what you're supposed to do at that moment, I think it can elevate so much more. The result can be so much more than, than if you just like don't care about it and cut corner. So that's, that's what I, I was doing. I'm not saying I'm making the best sandwich, and I'm not saying that American sandwiches are not good. It was just I didn't understand them. So it's in a uh, book. 
<laughs> so um, you and I have something in common, which is we both moved to San Francisco in our early 20s without ever, ever having been here before. Right. Um, so, and, and it seemed like you actually chose the city kind of randomly. Um, what do you think it would have been like for you to move to today's San Francisco? Um, well, I think, um, I don't know if you were, it would have been the same feeling. Maybe, I don't know, close maybe. I, I, you know, San Francisco changed so much and there is so many layers of difference things that's happening. But, um, you know, I always thought, you know, San Francisco is magi magical in a lot of ways. It's a place of where you, you feel free of who you are and, and you're not judged by anyone. And it's also a place that, it's a place of innovation. It's a place that started a lot of different movement. Um, it's a place of diversity. There's a lot of different culture here. There's a lot of history. Um, and it's a place that um, I think that maybe with just your luggage and nothing within your pocket, you can, I think you can make, you can make something out of yourself because it's surrounded by people that listen. And that's what San Francisco has been for me. And still today, you know, there is still, you know, I think the homeless problem is a problem for me that I don't understand why we're not tackling this and we're not helping all those wonderful people that don't have any housing when, you know, it's just, I don't know. But that's another, you know, I think that's another conversation. Do you, I mean, do you have any kind of thoughts on what the city could be doing better in that regard? Yeah, I think we, I think we need to um, uh, stop to be complacent and start to go the conversation and start to um, realize that, um, you know, those people are very important and they were a uh, long time ago. They've been, they've been, you know, the core of what San Francisco was, you know, and to be dismissive and to invite maybe other you know, company here to build a city and you want the city to be rich, you gotta, you gotta take care of your community first, you know? And I think it's a conversation and I think, you know, you know, honestly, perhaps this pandemic's gonna per perhaps help us to rebuild and redefine San Francisco and hopefully, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of, of those homeless people and they are wonderful. Their story are amazing. I mean, I not long time ago I was talking to this young woman that literally had a tent about a block away from one of my restaurants, which is Petit Crane. And I started to talk to her and I said, you, you know, my restaurant is here. Do you need anything? What? And she's like, no, you know, I, I live here because I, I I'm homeless. I don't have enough money to be in uh, to rent a house or an apartment, but I have a job. And I was just like. Wow. Yeah. So there is different layering, you know. And so what you see is like, why we have to charge so much money? Everybody should be, should have a roof under their head. You know, they should have a home to be. So I would love to have a discussion with Mayor London. And um, are you listening, Mayor London? Maybe she can. Uh, we have, <laughs> I, have a lot, I think a lot of people have a lot of ideas and we need to tackle that. This is, this is unacceptable. Another issue um, you're probably, you know, well familiar with is just, uh, you know, there's been a, a worker shortage for restaurants for many years. Um, the cost of labor sure. on top of just the high living expense. Um, and it's, it's in a, a business model that already has such thin margins to begin with, which right. is making operating restaurants here increasingly difficult. Right. Um, and that was even before the pandemic. Right. So I wanted, I wonder if you could talk about the ways that you've made your restaurant a place people want to work and can work um, and stay here despite the challenges. Um, right. I mean, yes. I mean, obviously, it's been um, it's been a challenge. I think all over uh, the United States, but all over the world too. Um, 
So what we, um, we, we understood that challenge and, um, you know, we don't want a cook or anyone that work at the restaurant that need to uh, rent a place with 20,000 people because that's the, that's the only thing that they can afford. We want them to be able to have a life um, uh, that is healthy and that is uh, inspiring and, and work is work, but is also uh, making sure that they feel that when they go home, they can also breathe, you know? So um, we um, very early on, um, we, um, you know, Minimum wage was not the starting point for us. We wanted to make sure that um, we wanted to pay a wage where um, it was livable. Um, I, um, with my um, with my business partner, you know, the bottom line was not about making profit, but making sure that we were also offering. Um, a medical insurance for Owen Kaplan, vacation, a place that uh, they could feel that, oh, I'm going to work, but I'm also I'm, I'm being taken care of. Uh, we developed it, a lot of different programs for education um, and, and also give a space of people, well, you know, I'm a cook right now, but I would love to, you know, become, you know, maybe a sommelier. So give them, you know, a space also for us to, so, so kind of create a family and give them the tool. So they felt that they were taking care of and they were seeing. So that way they could say, well, you know what? I want to grow within the company. And I know I have a space that I can grow. So creating that space so and to reinvest in, in, in the people that were working with us. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not juggling, you know, it's it's also you know for us to make that 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 point that yes we do have a business the, yes obviously there is money involved but people that are working with us they're making that business so we need to take care of them so it's kind of this this idea of of making sure that everybody was seeing and taking care of and believe me it's not easy you know it's not easy so with this pandemic i just you know we came together and i never believed in tips i never believed in tips and if anyone knows about the tips you know it comes so far away this story is I mean, I think it has to do with a little bit of slavery, you know? And so um, I would never believe that, oh, I'm going to give you tips because I think you did a good job. No, I always believe that we need to pay people and, and, and to pay for the job and their value. And it's very important, you know? And, and if someone want to, leave, want to leave something, great, but you need to pay a wage that someone deserves because they're doing the work and as tip or no tips should not be involved. So um, when we reopening actually Ukraine and um, we are eliminating, eliminating the, there's no more server. It's, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's sommelier and, and my kitchen that is doing an amazing work and they're making the food, so they want to serve the food to the guests. And no more, no more middle people, you know. So, and if they want to leave um, anything for anyone, that money will go across the board to the people in the kitchen. So the, their wages, you know, would be maybe more than, you know, but it would be, you know, they know, they know with the wages that they, they have right now, they can, I think, I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, I think, a CDP that starts at, at Atelier Crane that just come out of school. I think they're making a minimum of close to $60,000 a year just coming out. So, and, and with, you know, other things, and then there is, you know, forward camp. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good, you know, it's not, but it's not 20 or 30, you know, it's not yeah. that. Um, and then, you know, and then with uh, the sommelier, it's about giving them a salary and then if the, and giving them also a part of the business, a commission, you know. So trying to create um, um, really a system where 
everybody is equal. Everybody is treated equally. And so you got rid of tipping back in 2016, I think, um, at least for Atelier Kren. Um, yeah, and but but uh, to say that people keep tipping. Interesting. And so um, so the the it, it doesn't it doesn't um, they're not they're not um, um, working for um, oh I have to make so much tea tonight. No, they come to work, they know exactly what they're making and they're happy. And then if there is extra money, this is like, oh my God, this is great, you know. So it just changed the way, but I I never like tipping. Uh, tipping is something I didn't grow up with. Um, I know this is, um, I don't think it's a good way of um, um, rewarding someone when you pay them maybe a dollar or two dollars an hour and then the company think oh yeah i'm just not going to pay a lot of money but you know they have tips so they can leave with the tips it's like no don't don't think that way you know so yeah it it forces people in certain positions to to have to do things they might not want right. to do to try and make up that money yeah and that's not yeah. um so do you think all restaurants should get rid of tipping you know, it's we've been having, I've been having a lot of conversation with a lot of different uh, friend, uh, friends in San Francisco that are chefs that are own restaurant, and yes, they want the tips to go away, and they want to be able, you know, uh, to uh, pay, you know, their employee uh, the money they deserve. But you know, there's a lot of things also needs to happen. Also, you know, my industry. Um, it's been quite invisible for a lot of people, you know, we just, we've been treated in a way that is, it's hard, you know, we are on survival mode every day, we survive every day, you know, and, um, you know, I think lawmakers need to change the law, we need some help, uh, we can't, you know, we, we pay a lot of taxes, we pay a lot of, of things, and at the end of the day, it's just like, if you break even, it's great, but the next day you need to go back to work and you need to feed people. So during those pandemic, you know, when you s those mom and pop and, and they had to close because they were not going to do tech out. Tech out was not going to make them surviving. So I don't know, it's just, I think we are into a bigger conversation right now with a lot of, with the res restaurant association and with, with the governor and, and, and with the mayor and to try to change the way we've been treated um, as, as an industry. And, and it's interesting, you know, we, the small businesses represent, you know, we are, I think, 50.6 million people that are employed in my industry, you know, and then 4% of the GPD, but we also uh, con the connection of other industry. You know, if there is no food, there is no farmers, there is no fishmonger. There is no um, uh, essential, you know, people that will come and, and give us, you know, salt and olive oil and, you know, or the wine, you know. We connect a lot of industries. So um, so we need to be taken care of now. Definitely. I mean, I think uh, that's what really draws me to covering food and as a journalist. Um, yeah. It allows you to access so many other things, stories. Um, and I think also forcing people to ask questions about their food forces larger conversations. So um, right. you're not shy about that. Um, last year, you took meat off your menu, uh, except for seafood. Right. And um, so first, I'm curious, because I, I have not lived in France, and I'm not a French trained cook. Um, it, would that be a crazier thing for the French or for Americans? Um, huh. Like, do you think you would have gotten more shock and awe for doing that in France or less than here? Um, maybe, but not not anymore. There is more. I was in Paris last year, and there is more uh, restaurants that are serving vegetable and seafood or just vegan than mm. there is in the United States. But I want to tell you, so I. When I opened uh, Petit Crème, I never had meat on my menu. Hmm. We never had any bad product. I never advertised it as vegetable, and 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 the the, the the fish from you know from different fishmonger from the Bay Area never advertised it. 
Um, I took Meet out of Atelier two years ago, and then Bachren was uh, last year. And the reason why I did this is that the uh, the, fa the the meat factory, those industry, needs to go away. And it's it was for me to to take a stand. We need to understand where the food come from. I mean, I don't. I know a lot of little rancher that you doing. You know, you know they treat their animal very well. And I'm not. A, I'm not against them. But I wanted to make. I, will, I wanted the industry to wake up. It is like. I mean, have you? We 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 are a, a country of high consumption. Consumption. I mean, the meat that you are eating from whatever you know fast food. Do you know where the meat come from? I don't want to give that to my children. Yeah, you know, and it's it's not it's not it's not good. You know, and I think we need to realize that we need to balance the way that we eating and the way that we producing and the way that we engaging with nature, you know, and I think if we can get there, um, I'm not talking about taking meat out of the menu. I'm just saying that we need to reflect on the consequences of this, uh, after the 1950, when the industrialization of food happened, what's been happening, you know, 50 was not that long ago. Six, that was 60 years. And look at the world. We are in trouble right now. You know, climate and, and, and the way that, you know, the inequality also, uh, the food injustice. Uh, we, we saw exactly through that pandemic that, you know, you know the first uh, com uh, community that were affected was mostly you know african american and and the latino community and then if you really peel the layer you know exactly that those community they don't act they don't have access to the food that they should have access to but if you look at the story of everything up to the 1950 and 60 the best food in america was the food cooked by african american amazing and then the SP alone start to give money to those big companies like McDonald's and Burger King and whatever. And they went to those community and kill the culture and offer them something that was much cheaper. It's like, oh, I can give you food, you know, and then then the culture disappeared. And then and then what happened is just like we took the access of good food from them. So I mean it's just it's so political and, and I want to change that. We have the power to change that right now. And we need to look as, as a consumer, you know, when you spend you, your money, you need to know where your money comes from. Buying is an act of activism. Uh, eating is an act of activism. Look at everything, what you do in life. It, everything needs to have a purpose. Ask questions. And I think that it's what people want right now. They want, if they walk into a restaurant, they want to know what the chef is doing. What is their environment with climate change, with the food chain, with their community? How do you work with your community? Do you buy food because they are in season? Do you write a menu because you don't care, because you just want to write a menu, or just, just want to write a menu because you understand that when you cook this food is also going back to your community and then you're involving your farmers and your fishmonger and then maybe the person in Petaluma that's making amazing cheese, you know. What is your purpose, you know? I think um, for a lot of people, the thought of giving up meat, um, right? people talk about doing that for environmental reasons and yeah. I, I know that's one of the reasons you, you did it. Um, just during this pandemic, you know, the meat packing plants were the site of some of the worst outbreaks. Um, and I think this right. really revealed to a lot of people the conditions of working inside those plants and the fragility of the lives of people who work right. inside those plants. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, we, we heard from the federal government, the line was, we need to keep these plants open because Amer we can't have a meat shortage. Right. So uh, my point is, um, do you think people will start giving up meat for humanitarian reasons? Are you hearing 
Yes. People really talk do. like that now? I think, you know, I've been so uh, curious about the young, the, the young generation. And I think there's some data that just came out not a long time ago that is up to 30% of youngsters that are vegetarian and vegan. So wow. you're seeing, you know, um, yes, I really think that um, uh, to that people understand that this is this is much needed. You know, I mean, if you someone that is curious and really want to know that what you're putting in your uh, body, and then you learn that the way that the meat that is being processed is it's not that great, you know, it's like, and then it's, it's coming to yourself, to your body, you know, you know, we all energy, you know, that I think, um, I really think that it's changing a lot and it's been changing a lot, you know, a few years ago, I think the vegetarian and the vegan industry were probably at zero. Now they're like billion of dollars, you know, so, but you know, we have to, you know, we, I don't want to go to the extreme. I think we need to rebalance who we are as human and what we're eating and what we're producing. And for me, the first things for me is to uh, look at my community, what the farmer are, are doing, uh, what they're producing. I want to help them. I want to help them to be able to make their their farm uh, valuable and then so people can just buy also their produce. Uh, you know, we are very lucky. We are very lucky because we have a farm up in Sonoma. And during, during this pandemic, it was not about us buying food from somebody else. We used the farm to make the food. And it was all vegetarian. And uh, because I knew and I understand also the good of, you know, healthy beautiful food cook you know from farm to table you know and i didn't need any protein you know and and um because you can find protein in the vegetable too you know you can find yeah. you know, <laughs> potatoes have protein <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean there is there is you know there is country you know i mean there's part of india it's they've been on the vegetarian di diet forever uh there's places in japan too they just so you know, I think meat has become this thing about um, classes and luxury. And so for someone to say, oh, I'm going to go to a steakhouse, that just make them feel so powerful. But at the end of the day, it's just it's, you need to understand. You know, you need to be curious and understand, really. But I think it's, it's shifting, you know, now when I... You know, I, I I love it. I love it. But I don't want to be extreme once again. I'm not about all the way veganizing because, I, you know, there is some vegan food that I'm not sure about it because I'm looking at the ingredient. I'm like, mm, where did I come from? You know, there's nothing organic. There is, what is this? You know, so I think we have to come to the middle, but uh, those factory farming needs to stop. Very yeah. Um. So the way that you work with food has often been compared to how a modern artist works. Um, you're not just focusing on flavor, you're trying to capture a memory or evoke an emotion. Right. Um, and I wonder, you know, the, the twin crises that we've talked about or that you brought up earlier that you, you had lockdown during cancer and then during this pandemic. Um, and I wonder if that has approached your art or sorry, influenced your approach to your art, your ideas for dishes or given you any new ideas? Oh, yes, totally. You know, I mean, I think um, before I was definitely uh, trying to uh, tap into memories of my childhood and my also my travel. And then, um, then when the cancer uh, happen, happened, you know, and it's funny because I always eat, you know, I eat healthy, you know, but um, uh, I can have, I love my chocolate. I love, you know, I'm, I'm not like, you know, I just, I like, I like food, you know, I like good food and I always wanted to know, you know, where they come from, where the food come from. But with, it's interesting with the cancer, it had allowed me to be curious and do a lot of research about food. And, um, and 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 what food can bring you know to the body so so through the cooking also from atelier to uh petit crane to back crane, i mean the dishes the dishes that we make 
every ingredient has a purpose. It's really, we really, we are so interesting about this. And, and that's why, we, that's how we've been creating dishes. And um, I'm also, you know, been very uh, uh, fascinated by the history of California and mm -hmm. the Native American and here and how they were dealing with food and, and the, the earth and the planet and, 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 and that way of thinking and, and, and that philosophy really um, uh, inspire me. So um, we, um, I'm, we're creating a dish right now, it's called California. Mm -hmm. and, and um, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's all grain and vegetable and, and, and uh, mostly allium because allium, it's, it's everywhere in California, but it's uh, also um, um, trying to tap into the story of the time and space where I am. So, yeah, I mean, you know, those, those moments uh, bring a lot of curiosity within me and I, and, and I always try to integrate them in the food because food is a language. You know, food help to communicate maybe a sense of place, but also uh, a narrative that you want to express to others. Um, I, I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> no, I that sounds really interesting. I wonder if you there's a new film out called Gather that's just premiered. It's a documentary on um, Native American chefs around the country that I'm looking forward to seeing. Maybe yeah. you've already seen it, but. No, I haven't seen that. I want to see that. Yes, you know, um, but it just also um, it, it it's so interesting. You know, I think we can find the answer for today and for tomorrow when we look back to from yes to the past. Mm. Always find answer in the past, and um, I always believe that um, you know where you know with food, you know the you know when fermentation came into you know, being so a uh, trendy, it's, it's been down for centuries, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, yeah, I always look at, in the past to try to find new, new, new way of thinking because there's always answer, I think, there. Well, I just have um, one or two more questions, but I want to remind people that they will have a chance in 10 minutes for this Q&A. And so they can ask questions in the chat or comment section. Um, and so we're coming up on that. But um, I just wanted to get into an issue on a lot of people's minds, uh, especially right now. And, and that's the fight for racial justice. Um, so what do you think is a restaurant's responsibility in creating or fighting for racial equity? Well, I mean, it's, um, you know, I've been um, within myself, I've been fighting the this for a long time, equality has been always a must. Um, you know, my industry um, needs to really look deep because there is a lot of issues, inequality, racial issue. Um, I mean, woman, gay, you know, it's, 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 we need to, we need to do a lot of work. So what I will like for my peers and my colleagues to do, it's really to rethink about, you know, to really reflect on who they are and do their work, do their work um, uh, with themselves. And, 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 and don't just hire people you, because you think, don't hire just a woman because suddenly we have the Me Too movement, you know, don't hire, you know, um, 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 LGBT person because oh it's gay pride month and I just don't want you know people to think that I'm do not do that do your own work be the person that you want to be and give a voice and 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 opportunity to also to other and bring diversity to your restaurant bring that diversity, you're gonna see when you have diversity and when you start to see people and listen to their story, it's gonna bring so much more to who you are and what you're making because food is energy and those people, anybody that work with you, you're not on the line every day making the food, they are making the food and this is their voice on the plate also. So 
Um, I mean, I was talking to my friend Russell the other day, and my friend, my friend Tanya Holland, also that is uh, an incredible chef. Uh, Brown Kitchen, Brown Sugar Kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, amazing! I love her. Uh, we know each other for a long time, and people need to wake up, and action needs to be taken now. And and yes, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for people to look at themselves, and but he, he, we have to do that. Everyone has to do that. And they had to do that a long time ago. But, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, they didn't. But now it's the time. And it's, it's, a, it's an incredible time. And it's a beautiful time. And um, it should be, you know, you know, we say that food brings people together. We all say that. So let's walk the walk and talk the talk. If you said that food bring people together, bring people also together within your own uh, company, and um, don't um, don't discriminate. I, I don't. It's not okay. It's never been okay. It's not okay. So we, we're going to see some changes. I think. After have any of the protests um, or conversations right now sparked conversations in your staff about changes you want to make, you know, in the kitchen or the dining room? I mean, you know, is, you know, we've been um, a company that is been uh, that uh, fight for inclusivity since the beginning. So um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm telling you is I, I almost cried the other day because every single member of my team, they, they, they work faster than ever because they wanted to, to be a part of the protest. And it, it happened a few years ago when we did the protest, you know, the woman march and my team were like, can we close the restaurant for a couple of hours? And can we, and I'm like, yeah. And my team, those, those youngsters that work with me, I'm, I'm just so in awe with who they are. And they are such the future of, they are the now, but also the future of, of, of this country. And um, yeah, every day it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful discussion and I'm just, I'm just so, I'm so grateful, but I feel very lucky. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Dominique. I have a few more questions from our audience. Um, right. I don't think we'll get to them all, but um, I'll pick my favorites. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Stephanie wonders, you had a lot of confidence at a young age. Um, what explains how you managed to keep it keep that and pursue your career without getting discouraged? Good question. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Well, um, I was very young and my dad, um, I was, I was talking to him about success and, and I was talking to him about him seeing a lot of people coming in and out of, of, of the house and because he was a politician and I was like, wow, dad, you're so successful. You got everything you want. And, and it was like, Dom, this is not success. You have to have, you need to know yourself and you have, need to have confidence. You know, when you go out of this world, when you have a platform, you need to give back to others because things has been giving to you. But you need to com be confident in, in, in life. And, and remember, no one is better than you, but you're not better than anyone else either but you go out there with this that's their their set of mind and people are going to go at you and going to try to punch you but all, always know who you are inside get to know yourself and i think when you get at a very young age if you give that that tool to a young child and tell them that hey it's okay get to know who you are you are as good as other no one is better than you but you're not better than than other and, and it just gives them a different view, I think, of the world. And they can go to this world with this confidence that I think every child needs, you know. So, and it's not easy. At times, it's not easy. But 
um, that's that's what I work. I'm, I'm work. That's what I work in through life. This is the way I work every day, you know. And um, it's been it's been rich and incredible, and 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 that's who I am. So that's what I would say to people: know yourself and find your own confidence, because you have a voice. So you're known for breaking barriers. This question comes from Lynn. Um, you're known for breaking barriers. What barriers are still left in the food industry to break? <laughs> A lot of barrier. Um, <laughs> well, I think um, um, the first of all, equality needs to. It's there is a lot of barriers still. There is a lot of inequality. There is also uh, pay. I think everyone needs to be paid uh, uh, for their time and be uh, everybody is valuable and every need, everybody needs to be looked at not as a number but as a person that is very valuable for your company. So that it's uh, it needs to happen. Um, I think the the ego in the in the kitchen sometimes needs to calm down. And um, I mean, we have a lot of work to do in my industry. Like, I think we talk about this. So, um, you know, I want the media to understand that food is, um, there is, there is no uh, discrimination with food. So don't uh, put women or other people in a, in a box when you put the other on top of the world. Uh, that needs to still happen, you know? Um, and you know, the way that you do, you, you, you do those things is I think to come to the table and to have a conversation with everyone and not be, not to alienate anyone. I want to invite anyone that has been, I want to say an asshole in the kitchen and treating people not the right way. I'm thinking there that, they, that no one has a voice. I'm inviting them to the table. Hey, you were not perfect. I'm not perfect. Let's come together and trying to find the best way to bring people together and, and to look at humanity as a whole. And then food would be the catalyst to all that. So, so I'm, that's my answer. <laughs> um, so this question comes from Jeremy and he said it's a question for either of us. Um, what do you think of what's going on at Bon Appetit? And do you think the magazine Bon Appetit. Do you think this will have a lasting effect on food media? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm happy to weigh in too, but yeah, I, mean, I would love for you to weigh in. You know, okay. Um, you can start. So I I think that it will have a lasting effect. Um, I think there have been a lot of sharp essays and um, writers on this issue of, you know, um, racism and in food journalism and um, in media and the fact that the media is so predominantly white. There've been a lot of people sounding the alarm on that for a lot of years, but I don't think it's um, this conversation has, has happened at, you know, such a, a prominent publication. And I, and I think that, you know, the conversation that what happened at Bon Appetit recently forced is going to reverberate much more loudly. That's my hope. Um, I, I just really feel like we need to get a more diverse set of voices writing about food and writing about their stories because really food is personal identity. It's, it's culture, it's history. And that can't just come from white journalists. So. No, I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I would, I, I mean, I think it's been a, a problem with, with uh, the food industry that there is just um, the people that have been writing a lot of things, you know, the, it was always the same people. There was, there was no diversity. They didn't know the struggle or the story of others. So they were not interested in other people's story because they thought it was just one way of doing stories, you know. And um, I'm not going to say, you know, who I was talking to, but the other day I was just like, what are you guys doing with your publication? I was like, well, you know, we try to have, you know, African American, you know, um, and then others as being, you know, a journalist, but we can't find them. And I'm like, what? 
that that narrative need to stop. Like need to stop. What we need to do right now, everyone needs to come to the table. Need to take their own responsibility and need to start to do the work. That's all we need to do right now. We not need to find any excuses or you know we couldn't do that. Oh well, you know we could never talk about women because there is no woman chef. I'm like, what? I, I came in San Francisco in the '90s, and then you had it was like most of the restaurant was lead where we with with amazing chef that mostly were were women. You know, it's like where that things come from. So let's talk about excuses. Start to take your responsibility and start to do the work. Do not ask what to do. Do the work. Do your research. Be a journalist. Tell the story. Don't just put, you know, you know, a list. Start to go to the, to those restaurants. Talk to people. Really get into, you know, and maybe it would be good for you to be curious, but also allow, allow other voice. You know, there is there's a lot of different journalists out there. They come from different backgrounds. And I think they are amazing writers, but they never also been giving a voice. You know, I mean, in the publishing company, you know, world also, there's a lot of books that were never published because they didn't feel that it was relevant to what the society wanted. And it's crazy to me. Um, I'm just, no, I want to hear everybody's voice. It's not because you have blue eyes and blonde hair that you better than someone that has dark eyes and dark hair, you know, or dark skin. It's like, who are you to define yourself that you're superior than others? It's crazy to me. And um, we're gonna see there is some amazing story. I mean, I'm a I'm a DC, I'm a disciple I'm a, and I'm a fan, fan of Jim Baldwin. Jim Baldwin, one of the most incredible uh, writer and poet in America, and he happened to be African American. I love Michael Mal, Malcolm X, you know. But I also love Sartre. I also love the Bo- the Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir. I love everything because I w- I love people that write good. If someone that write you know that cook amazing food, I really don't care where they come from and which country. If the food is great, I just love it. I want to know, and I, and I'm interested in that you know because food tells story. So I think they need to they need to start to do the work now. And stop apologizing. Take your own responsibility and do the work. That's 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 how we're gonna move forward. So this um, question comes from Raquel, and she wonders: Are there any up and coming chefs we should be paying attention to? Um, hmm, a lot, I think. I think we need to pay attention to to people that we haven't paid attention to. So um, I think it would be nice to go to your community and, and, and find, you know, people that you are excited and inspire you. Um, you know, I always thought that cooking is a way of communicating with others, but I think for me, a true chef is someone that tells a story and tell, tell their own story. It's very personalized. And I think a lot of people now, I think I, I, I'm just so excited um, I've never been interested to go to a restaurant where the menu is exactly the same menu than other restaurants. I'm always be attracted to go to a restaurant to understand the person that is cooking the food. You know, um, I have this uh, this uh, I have this story that um, I was in New Orleans um, two years ago, and I was doing. Um, a talk with a uh, woman, uh, my, woman in my industry and empower, empowering women through food. And um, it was just so inspiring. And and I w- it was this young cook that came to me and he had my book, my cook, my first book. And it's like, can you sign it? It's like, yeah. And it's like, oh, where do you work? It's like, ah, I work at the Commander Palace. It's like, oh, yes. I, I, be, I was there last night. It was great. It's like, yeah, I know everybody was like so excited. And I'm like, no, it was really great. And then he asked me, Severin asked me, um, I would love to come in and 
stuff. I'm like, yeah, great. Okay, this is my email. You know, this is my sous chef. You know, you can like, and he came and he stayed with us for a year. Wow. And then we had long talk. And Severin is someone that uh, lived in New Orleans and his, his root is in Senegal. And he was asking me, um, should I go back to where I come from, Senegal, because I want to bring that, all those knowledge that I have. And I want to bring, you know, I want to bring my country to the level of French cuisine and Italian. And, and I'm like, just bring your, your, your country in a way that you cook the food that you know this is what the story is going to be. And he went back to Senegal and then he's opening his restaurant in, in New Orleans. He went back to New Orleans. So um, I think he's, he's been doing, when he was, with, when he was working with us, uh, he was doing some pop-ups. So I'm very excited about, uh, about what he's going to uh, bring uh, to the table. And um, there's a lot of very talented people. And we need to start to look at people and, 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 and chef and maybe little restaurant, you know, that maybe we haven't take the time because of the media, they just give you a list and this is what you need to be able to eat. You know, let's be more open, you know, and, and I think it starts with the community and it starts with us, you know, also, I love to go out and to restaurant that nobody talk about because I love the food and I love the people and that, that, that really bring richness within me also and because I'm learning more about other things and maybe that also can be a part of my DNA when I cook oh I get this flavor at this restaurant and I remember when I talked to the chef she was telling me the story of her grandmother or and then suddenly I bring maybe that little spice in, inside of my cooking so it's very rich on a lot of ways so you know that way what was um what was the chef's name you were talking about the one who's opening the restaurant and so uh, his name is Severin and I'm gonna uh, uh, try to find the name of his restaurant so I can I just did a um, um, a little um, Severin I think it's uh, it's no lie and he sent me everything it's like chef look he's so pr- I love him I think he's so proud uh, you see. Uh, so a quick question then while you're looking is what is, and this question comes from Elizabeth because it's my favorite question. What is your favorite chocolate? Oh, um, it's the chocolate that my pastry chef is making. Juan mm. uh, So he's been, um, okay, I don't know why I can't find him on Instagram. His name is Severin. Oh yeah, here you go. Um, his restaurant is called Dakar Nola. Dakar nice. is, you know, so is in, uh, um, he's amazing. Is there you go. Everybody, everybody want to follow him is. Dakar is, Nola. Yes. New Orleans. New Orleans. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, we, so my, um, so Juan's making chocolate, literally. We're making everything from scratch, actually, and it's the best chocolate I've ever um, uh, ate. And he works with a lot of different farmers, you know, and and uh, f- some chocolate, you know, chocolate come, can come from the Dominican Republic, from, can come from all over the world, you know, where, and, and um, but it's, 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 um, it's probably darker, uh, I would say 75% maybe cacao, mm-hmm. uh, but I love praline, also chocolate praline. And is praline, praline is, you give me praline and chocolate with praline is, you, you have me. I, can, I Like I can do anything you want me to do. I mean, it depends what it is, but <laughs> uh, my father used to uh, every Sunday, he used to go to uh, the, the, the bakery and used to obviously bring, you know, chocolate croissant and chausson and all that. But he used to bring me that bouche au chocolat that was made with praline and hazelnut. And mm-hmm. it's like this, this bouche that, you know, it's a hard shell, but when you, you eat it, it's like soft praline chocolate and it's... <sighs> Uh, I mean, it's delicious. So you're making us all very hungry. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, love. So do you want to finish some, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so it is an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers the following question. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? Let's hear it. Yeah. Oh, okay, 60 seconds. To change the world is be, be the person that you want to be to change the world. And then when you start to understand yourself and you really walk the walk and talk the talk, it's about education, it's about humanity, it's about uh, curiosity, it's about spending your money uh, with purpose, uh, it's about making sure that the next generation have the tool to be uh, better and and the work is now because we get to forge the way for a new world for the for the for the new kids out there. I have two six years old, so believe me, I want to change the world what one mouth at a time through food, but to also curiosity and to do the work also. So um you know, we have the responsibility now. I don't want them to to have a world that is not working anymore. So, so come together about education and it start with us as adults and, and, and make sure that the next, next generation has the right to, to be able to be better people that we were. And it's all about humanity. Let's come together. Thank you, Dominique Cran, for joining us. Uh, Today at Inforum. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so we'd like to remind the audience that copies of Dominique's new book, Rebel Chef, are available to purchase now. Rebel, Rebel Chef, yes. <laughs> <laughs> With the hat. With the hat. Um, if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Maddie Oatman, and thank you. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.